Kura, Talofa, Namaste, Haremite, and welcome to this week's episode of the Niche Cast, Aotearoa's best sporting podcast to have ever existed on planet Earth. We are here to um, dive into some Kiwi sporting topics. We've got a little Black Caps activity for their upcoming ODI series against Netherlands. They do have an T20 International Series as well of one game, so who cares? We also have some uh, blokes playing football. We have the Wellington Phoenix. We'll touch base with them. They are looking okay. Probably the best of the uh, trans-Tasman teams at the moment, Wellington Phoenix, as well as all whites are busy. I don't want to be aggressive against the Oceania neighbours, but they are winning their Oceania qualifier games. Like, mad respect to our Oceanic neighbours. We also have Warriors versus Tigers, so we're going to put the uh, regular focus on the Warriors, but also Kiwi NRL focus this week is on the West Tigers under the umbrella of Aotearoa Kiwis coach Michael Maguire. So that will be a bit of fun as well. Um, a little check-in with the UFC as well, because we've got Kaikara France fighting this weekend against a dude by the name of Eskar. Askarov. Dan Hook had a loss last weekend as well, so shout out to him. And that's on the agenda for this uh, this week's episode. Early in the week, we record our Patreon podcast, so pick it up to all the Patreon whanau, supporting the Niche Cache and all our content, patreon.com forward slash our Niche Cache. Every Monday, early in the week, there is an extra podcast, usually on the back of the sporting weekend, reacting to some of the sporting mahi from the weekend before we get into our variety show, which is a bit more hard and fast, a bit more um, smorgasbord buffet type. So pick it up to all the Patreon fano. Thank you for your support. And the best way to support the Niche Cache and our content right now is via Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash our Niche Cache, eat our Niche Cache. Every Monday and Friday, we always serve up the email banger as well thenichecache.substack.com whack in your email address and then Monday and Friday evenings you get all the Niche Cache content straight to your email inbox podcast links uh, links to all the latest written content as well as extra yarns lots of football yarns to be had from the wildcard in the email every email basically includes football so if you're an Aotearoa footballing nutter a freakazoid make sure you check out um, those emails, I'm always dropping little Kiwi NRL nuggets, little cricket nuggets as well, um, bits and pieces from the UFC. On Monday, the Wildcard updated us all on the Ledger Walker sisters as well, which was fabulous. And any other funky bits and pieces of Aotearoa sporting content. I saw a video of uh, Kane Williamson playing a guitar over in the IPL. Wasn't singing, but he was doing a bit of a do 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 So that might pop up in the email or you might just get a Stephen Adams interview. Whatever it is, it's Aotearoa sport injected into your veins like some spinach and kale and oranges with the vitamin C. It's just nutritious, delicious Aotearoa sporting content. Thenichecache.substack.com for the email banger. And of course, we're always writing about Aotearoa sport on our website, www.thenichecache.com. Live this week, we've got our two Kiwi NRL spotlights. I put the spotlight on Dean Mariner as a funky Kiwi NRL prospect, updating all things Dean Mariner, as well as uh, put the focus on Griffin Niami, the latest, the new Greymouth Geezer 2.0. Shout out to the first Greymouth Geezer, Slade Griffin. And now it's Griffin Niami, a lot of Gs, double G, triple G, OG, YG, it's the Greymouth Geezer, Griffin Niami, and uh, mad respect to the original, Slade Griffin. All Whites is writing, uh, the Wild Card is writing about the All Whites. The All Whites aren't writing about the Wild Card, but the Wild Card is writing about the All Whites. Flying Kiwis is live. Um, I'll do a Kaikara France written preview. Done my Diary of a Warriors fan preview as well. Lots of Aotearoa sporting content for you to read and learn and um, connect with on our website, www.thenish-cache.com. We always start our podcast wildcard with a dose of mindfulness. Serve it up 
and bang it into the corner of the surface square for a winner if we're playing tennis. Right. I was, I was picturing a football thing at, at first, like popping it down long into the corners and then, I don't know, whipping across to Chris Wood or something like that. Clayton Lewis over to Nico Kerwin back into Chris Wood. Um, this is Greco-Roman philosopher Plutarch who said, the man of yesterday has died in the man of today. The man of today dies in the man of tomorrow. Repeat it again, please. The man of yesterday has died in the man of today. The man of today dies in the man of tomorrow. So every day you're just the uh, brand new, brand spanking new, born again. Reborn, yeah. Oh. That, that actually like, that is, uh, that hits home because you're just, you as a person, you are just like the sun. You're just like the moon. Every cycle you just pop up again you awake from your slumber and you're here again born fresh brand spanking you ready to have a fucking fantastic day which is what we're here to do yep and don't have to be like tied to the person we were yesterday because the person we were yesterday is gone like we don't we don't have to feel like that's an anchor or anything like that um we have the ability to reinvent ourselves with each, each one of those like rebirths um Every day is a fresh day. Lots of ways you can take that one, you know. Um, and what was the other one I was going to say? Um, uh, I can't remember what the other angle I had on that was, but I think it was to do with that first bit that I was saying, like a spin-off idea of that thing about just like, you, you had a bad day yesterday? Who cares? Like the person you were then is gone. Like you, You're someone else now. Um, you don't have to be like tied to that anymore. Each day is a fresh start. We always dabble in a bit of mindfulness to start the podcast, and we like to parlay that mindfulness into practical, grounded, um, not advice, but just in a sense of how you can context. apply that content. Well, yeah, just to apply it to your day to day life, how you can bring very airy, fairy, esoteric ideas into your day to day existence. And we also like to conduct ourselves from a place of mindfulness we like to hold each other accountable being mindful when we otherwise might not be and then each case always tries to operate from a place of mindfulness and i have had to be very mindful wildcard i've had to exercise practical mindfulness because um some of the white fern stuff has really whipped up some negative energy that I have then had to apply my mindfulness to seeing other people come up with various ideas as to why the white ferns struggle. Um, I've seen the non-selection of Lee Kasprick defended by a former white fern. I've seen money thrown around as a reason for the white ferns being shit. Um, and I've had to apply my mindfulness here because can get a bit in the old, uh, like, well, I'm actually here watching the White Ferns every game, watching Super Smash every game. I'm writing about the White Ferns every week. Like, I'm in deep in these mangroves, and I'm damn sure I missed the Joker writing about the lack of money for a certain mainstream media website. Fairly sure he's never watched the Women's Super Smash, you know? Fairly sure he wasn't talking about the White Ferns when they sucked a year ago, a year before that as well. So I've had to... This is just to say that I've had to take time to express my mindfulness through this context of the white ferns and all of which has led me to be a bit nervous now wildcat because I'm sensing a bit of magic is in the air and I have envisioned a scenario where the white ferns actually qualify for the top four of this World Cup. And I am, that makes you a bit, that makes me feel a bit weird because I've just done the whole debrief yarn. Did I jump the gun? They still have a chance. I believe in the magic. Could these players elevate their mana in spite of all the other bullshit even further and say, you know what? We're going to qualify. And that would also take like the cricketing gods to say, you're going to qualify because a lot of other shit has, weird has to happen. But, um, 
what are you putting the chances of the White Ferns actually qualifying for finals cricket at this World Cup as of Thursday? Is my nervous energy unfounded or is it warranted? Did I jump the gun a bit early? Help me out here. <laughs> um, you know that bit in like in in Dumb and Dumber where he's talking to the girl at the end and he's like, so what are the chances of you and us? And she says, I don't know, one in a million. And he's like, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> it, I think it's like that kind of scenario. There's um, maybe a 5% possibility of the white fans getting, like they, they kind of need just too many other results to go their way. Um, and net run rate isn't necessarily their friend, even though it's, sh- you you'd think it should be because they had three extremely close losses, but they didn't, really smoke anyone they're gonna have to destroy pakistan in that last game um and they did get pretty comprehensively crunched by australia which did a lot more damage than the three close losses might were able to like cover for um so i still don't really see it happening but there is a possibility it's a it's a um it's an outcome that's still um you know in the stars somewhere there is a path to it somewhere through that like bloody labyrinth um I I think because they're like, they're going to be able to have a full crowd now for that Pakistan game. So I think hopefully, like hopefully they do go out there and get a big win. And then it's one of those things of just like control what you can control. Probably not going to make the semis if they do. It's a lovely bonus. But if they don't, hopefully they do get a massive crowd. Um, they do get a lot of support. They do get a comprehensive victory, and they do get to sort of like you know feel the love from a um, from a home World Cup in a way which they. Because I mean they've, they've had like the, the crowds have been good for what they've been able to be like that's been cool um, and there's been an interest and a spotlight on the white ferns but a lot of that's been tainted by some of the close defeats and like the not living up to expectations now they're at a point where it's like nothing to lose um, I do hope they get a big like spectacle game in that in that last match against Pakistan I hope there's a big crowd I hope there's heaps of support I hope they get to feel the love um and hopefully they get through to the semi-finals from all of that um don't see it happening but um you know that's one of those like the the semi-finals are the the man of tomorrow right that we're not up to that person yet we're still in today um oh that was what the other thing was from the mindfulness was just like that it's another way of um it's another way of saying living in the moment right is forget about yesterday forget about tomorrow etc anyway that's kind of applied to this white ferns context we're like maybe so there's, there's a chance of making the semi-finals. It's a very unlikely chance. I wouldn't even bother thinking about it until after they've played Pakistan and see if it's still possible at that point. Um, but hopefully they do get that big game and that big sort of spectacle that they that they deserve. And they would, it would, wouldn't like, it's not quite what was envisioned when they came into a home World Cup, but, you know, it, it would at least be something. I would actually much rather a big like big Kiwi crowds in attendance of the non-White Ferns games. Like some, if, if that, to me, that would show the real standing of Aotearoa sporting fandom, um, the standing of Wahine sport in Aotearoa, the standing of cricket in Aotearoa, because we, we all know cricket is blowing up as far as popularity goes. And I think if you got, for some of the semifinals and final, if you got big crowds there, massive atmosphere, I think it would be a pretty cool uh, way to finish the World Cup from an Aotearoa perspective. Um, and then coming back into the White Ferns, ideally, Bob Carter just vanishes and then the <laughs> players take control of that their last performance against Pakistan. And um, not, ne- not necessarily a mutiny, just Bob Carter, later bolt, going to go have a beer. Everyone else is like, sweet. Um, and then the White Ferns just come out and play some cricket. That would be fantastic. Um, Radio Wildcat. Just want to drop a couple of notes here on some UFC matters because it is a little stint of city kickboxing UFC action. We had Dan Hooker fighting in London last week. We got Kaikara France fighting in Ohio, I believe, this week. Let's check in with Kaikara France fighting Eskar Askarov. Eskar Eskarov has won his last three fights after a draw. Uh, and Kaikara France has won his last or two fights, sorry, after a loss against Roy Val. That was the one. Eskar Eskarov seems a bit more proficient in wrestling and grappling. 
and is also a lively striker. So that would be an interesting contest for Kaikara France. Kaikara France was actually one of the most, if not the most winningest city kickboxing fighter last year and is doing pretty well in the flyweight division. A win here would set him up for a real decent crack at the top of the flyweight division, maybe even a title bout. In the wider context of city kickboxing, I'm fascinated to see what happens here because Hook had a loss last week. And all of the stuff around Hooker dropping weight, cutting weight, it made sense. It wasn't like I was buying into the spin of how Hooker cut the weight. It all makes sense. We talked about this, more technology, um, greater just awareness of diet and nutrition compared to when Hooker last fought, I think it's the featherweight division, when he last fought at that weight division, um, so much progress has been made, which in theory would make the weight cut easier. Unfortunately, signs of a bad weight cut were there in the fight because Hooker looked slow. He looked a bit sluggish compared to how he usually looks. And, you know, just like bro science, fight science, the <clears throat> when you're cutting weight, there's less uh, agua around the brain in the noggin which then protects you or doesn't protect you from people punching your face. So if you're carrying less, less water weight and less protection in your noggin, some of those punches hit harder. That's why you see fighters who are cutting weight, they can just get smoked because there's less protection around there. Again, not scientific, just bro science. But those, both of those signs were there for Dan Hooker and just didn't look good. It really didn't look good. Um, flying to London quickly, hard and fast, probably didn't help. But the, and whether the weight cut was a factor there or not, I don't know, but it didn't look good. It looked kind of terrible. And there was one of these fights where if you're a casual Kiwi sports fan, don't watch Dan Hooker fights. <laughs> they hurt. They hurt the viewer. You're watching just some dude get annihilated. Even when he performs well, even when he like wins fights, it's brutal. Um, and we've now seen a lot of these brutal fights. Dustin Poirier, uh, there was the Barboza fight, Paul Felder fight. Like this, Dan Hooker receives beatings, brutal beatings. And thankfully, his brutal beating against Arnold Allen in London was just a first round loss and not a three round thing like similar to the Dustin Poirier. I think that was a five rounder of just absolute shenanigans, just wartime shenanigans. So... All of which is to say, interesting little pocket here for City Kickboxing Wildcard because I'm curious, like they have not won as many fights as they would have liked. They have not kicked on as much as they would have liked or as much as I would have envisioned. However, it was all during the pandemic. So all the niggle has clearly impacted their uh, trajectory in the UFC. They've introduced new fighters, Carlos Ulberg, Blood Diamond. There might be more. Um, so that's working out well. Israel Adesanya is still the champ. Brad Riddell is still climbing. Other than that, blokes are losing. Carlos Ulberg and Blood Diamond both stepped in for the first UFC fights and looked a bit shell-shocked, looked a bit like just frozen on the biggest stage. Carlos Ulberg then went on to have a win in his second fight. This is an interesting period for City Kickboxing coming out of the pandemic. A lot of their fighters have lost more fights than they have won. Kaikara France has a chance to rectify a lot of this and put City Kickboxing on his shoulders and say, no, nah, we're not going anywhere. I'm holding it down, top of the flyweight division against a really good fighter by the name of Askarov. And I think this is a crucial juncture for City Kickboxing and um, with Kaikara France's fight this weekend. Nice. I'm still a little bit, um, I still got the image in my head of Bob Carter just disappearing, like fading into the darkness of his sunglasses or something. <laughs> um, but hey, maybe tomorrow's Bob Carter will be, will be more self-aware than today's Bob Carter. Um, on Dan Hooker, because I read something about his his weight loss thing and how it wasn't just like because a lot of fighters when um when shifting divisions it'll be like something that they just do in that training camp like um 
if you're going up, you just pile on the weight late sort of thing and make weight and then maybe go throw up in the bathroom afterwards or something like that. Or you're trying to lose weight, you'll starve yourself for a day. And then um, just why you see them like chomping into a Mars bar or a Snickers or something straight after they get off the scales, you know, um, it sounded like with Dan Hooker, it really was like a sustained thing. Like this was not like the reason they were confident about it was because he, he did this over like months, not weeks. Like he was, um, he wasn't just trying to give his body a shot kind of thing. He was like, I'm, I'm going to like get into this like natural body state now. Like I'm, I'm, no, I'm going to make this the natural body state of like doing it over extended period of time. So interesting to hear you say that it did seem to still affect him. Um, I, I would imagine the travel as well, but that, that point you made about um, him taking a lot of beatings, like even when he wins, I wonder as well, like, would, do you think there's like a cumulative effect there? Is, because you you can see that in fighters sometimes like they just take a few too many um you know had heavy shots in previous fights and then it's sort of they just it's, sometimes it's psychological um sometimes it's just like straight up physical um often probably a bit of both like it does have an effect in future fights it can slow you down do you, do you think there's like an element of that there with him i don't think it's a accumulation that is slowing him down. Um, if there he's was, also taken tough fights, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if there was, there are more than enough smart people around him to step in. Um, the thing about Dan Hooker is that his mana and his reputation has been elevated because of his willingness to fight in any situation, regardless of travel nickel against anyone which in uh in the lightweight weight class i think that's it he was fighting the best blokes like um so of course you're going to be involved in really tough fights and that's what he was doing um but that's how you earn a career like they all have visions of yeah we want to be champion also you earn money with each fight you earn, you pay your bills with each fight. Um, a lot of these dudes have very, various other business interests, which again might be in favor of Dan Hooker here, where he can step back and not take these fights, just to allow things to settle down and allow his business interests to come into the equation. Because Arnold Allen has fought like like his opponent on the weekend. He fought like only a couple times since the pandemic started. Whereas Dan Hooker's jumped at every opportunity where it's like respect, like it's a, you earn respect that way. You earn money that way. It's also like, okay, do you need to like that? That's where you get into like, I think it's hard for us who we're not blatantly not fighters. It's hard for us to really understand that mindset of like, yeah, give me another scrap. Rah. Like I, that, that's hard to do, but the, the biggest note here is that there are more than enough people around Dan Hooker to step in if there is an issue, if there is a health issue or, um, you know, a career issue with taking so much damage. The, I just want to be clear, the methods of like the weight cutting stuff you mentioned at the start of your question there, none of that applies right now blokes are yeah. not doing that like it's all very scientific it's all um a lot of it is based on water um they have a specific team around them as well as the time it took to to get down the weight as well so it's not like dan hooker's flying to london spewing up a few times going in a sauna and you know you know taking diuretics to clean out a system and cut weight like I'm pretty sure no fighter's ever taken diuretics to cut weight, but um, just I wouldn't to, be too sure. <laughs> just to be dramatic here, Dan Hook is not doing any of that stuff. Um, a very scientific process, yeah. which is why I believed it would be all good. Um, maybe he just didn't have a good day, and it's all good. Move on. Let's uh, do a little black caps here, Wildcard. We have the uh, series against the Netherlands coming up, the ODI series, and we have each come up with three players we are very interested in. We've selected three individuals to help set up this uh, Black Cats versus Netherlands series. Three players that we are most interested in. I'm going to let you 
choose your first one here, Wildcat. If I've got the same one on my list, I'll just chuck it in and we can talk about it there. Uh, yeah, so um, I, <laughs> I, we didn't like set strict parameters or criteria for this, um, kept it nice and loose, but I, I'd be surprised if um, anyone listening would think of the series and not jump straight away to uh, Luteru Ross Potor Lotte Taylor. His final three ODIs for, for the Black Caps. Um, I am dreaming of a scenario where he takes a wicket with his final ball in ODI cricket as well, like chuck him on to, against the 10th wicket partnership or something in the last game, if that's possible. Um, I looked up some of his batting stuff to see, like, are there any records left to break? And uh, nope, uh, he's, he's broken them all and pretty comfortably. Like, I think he's about 500 runs ahead of Stephen Fleming now in terms of overall uh, like seven and a half K or something. So probably not going to hit a milestone there. I doubt it's, it's 500 runs in this, um, in this series, most hundreds. He's like five ahead of, uh, I think Nathan Astle now at this point, um, most 50 plus scores. He's also like about 15 ahead of Nathan Astle there. Um, Martin Guptill's closing in on a couple of these surprisingly Guptill more than Williamson. Um, and I actually don't think like, cause I think everyone knows that the, the test run, tally like the most runs for the black caps and test matches that ross taylor has everyone knows kane williamson is going to catch that i'm not convinced that he's going to get taylor's odi mark though because we just don't play enough odis at the moment um and taylor only had like a four-year head start ahead of williamson and he's considered he's, you know about two thousand runs ahead of him still at this point i'm not sure williamson's going to get there so um especially if odi cricket is just going to be less prominent um moving forward as it has been certainly for um you know in Aotearoa for the last few years then that you know some of those tailor marks might might last for a long time you don't necessarily expect to see like records are there to be broken right so you you should see um uh, like no one should be out there dreaming about like keeping their records for eternity like you want the next generation to come and top that the key is whether you held that record when you retired that like anything that happens after that who cares like if you held that record at retirement then that's your record you know um i yeah I, I but i don't see too many people challenging some of those taylor batting knocks let alone like the fact he averages 48 and in, in odis as well which is also um a new zealand record like I just don't see many of those things being topped. I don't see him necessarily adding too much to those um, over, a, you know, a pretty small three-game series, but he'll add a little bit. And, um, you know, it'll be a good, a lovely farewell, and he's going to get a big crowd at Seddon Park in his, in his final game, and it's going to be beautiful. My first player is Cole Jamison. Mm. He has plateaued a wee bit in Test cricket, and now he's coming into ODI cricket where he has five wickets in five games at an average of 37.2. He, those games are split across 2020 and 21, two games, 2020, three games, 2021. Now coming into a series against Netherlands, which is, uh, you know, one of the weaker opponents that the Black Caps will face over in this current kind of cycle. So the culmination of Jamison maybe plateauing a wee bit and not continuing the blast-off phase that we saw in Test cricket, now coming into ODI cricket where he hasn't been as dominant, and I'm also thinking, like, think back to the IPL last year, Jamison was okay to start with, I think, or maybe it was the 2021, but he definitely hit a wall at some stage in the IPL as well. So I'm just curious as to where Kyle Jamison, the bowler, goes from here, showing world-class Red Bull signs, showing promising white ball signs, and this might be a series against Netherlands where Kyle Jamison can build some confidence with the white ball. And he's also got a chance to really lead the Black Caps attack with this in the same department. Um, there are more experienced seamers in the attack, but Jamison is a, I think a lot of people view him as a world-class bowler. And this hasn't been played out with the white ball just yet. So what's Cole Jamison going to be up to against the Netherlands? Who's your second pick there, World Cup? Well, my second pick, um, 
angles in nicely with that one because I'm going to go with Matt Henry here because as we know, this is a um, this is a Black Caps ODI team that's missing like 12 players for um, for IPL stuff and probably uh, trying to think if there's anyone else who's injured who would otherwise be there. Probably not so much, um, but yeah, it's considerably it'd actually be interesting to look at like what the what the first 11 against netherland looks like versus like the 11 you could make up out of the ipl players and 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 compare them um but matt henry is in the way that he like you know he's not really on the 2020 scene but he has like burst onto the test stuff well not burst on he's been in and around that test team for a long time but he had a real breakthrough performance in that series against south africa um However, he's always been that kind of guy in ODI cricket. Like he's been an excellent ODI bowler for a long time, and he is first 11, and he gets picked ahead of Tim Southey anyway. Um, he might be the only first 11 bowler in the squad. Um, you know, there's no there's no Bolt, there's no, um, I said Southey's sort of in and out. Um, there's no Lockie Ferguson, no Mitchell Santner, etc. cetera. Um, that is, like Kyle Jamison is on that fringe. He's, he's in and out a little bit, um, but... That's as far as I see looking at this. Um, and you have guys like Doug Bracewell as, as an experienced international um, player is in this squad. Um, you know, East Sodi as a spinner. Uh, and Jamison, of course, himself as well. Blair Tickner's in there. Hasn't actually played an ODI yet, but will surely get a go over the course of the series. Colin de Gronholm as well, obviously. Um, but Matt Henry, as I see it, is the leader of this bowling attack. And that's a position he has very rarely, probably never been in um, as a Black Caps player. Uh, we do see him do this a lot, like the leader of the Canterbury Bowling Attack, dropping back Plunkett Shield, taking a heap of wickets and everything. But this is a nice opportunity for him to not just be the other guy, but to be like the main man in, a, in an ODI series. And he's in good form. Um, and he loves this format as much as anything. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing him... Uh, you know, commit untold carnage upon these uh, Dutch batsmen. Will Young probably doesn't deal in carnage. He's a bit, you know, slicker. He, yeah. he deals in uh, quality and just smooth sailing. And I'm, I'm curious, I'm intrigued about Will Young in this ODI series against Netherlands. Will Young's only played two ODIs which is actually fewer games in ODI cricket than T20 international cricket. And we now, we now know, um, we now know, know, believe, there is clarity around Will Young being a decent test batsman. Like, it's not like, maybe, I think if you've seen Will Young bat, you can see the dude's all good. Of course, you ride the wave. Your ups and downs, test cricket, it's a bit niggly. But Wu Young's got some class to him. And there is not much of a difference between the one-day Wu Young and the four-day Wu Young in the domestic format. His list day average is 37.6. His first class average is 41.6. Same ballpark, same cricket field, same deep pocket of the boundary. And to me, that is a clear indicator. Like when dudes are scoring runs, decent runs in all three formats with their strike rates uh, aligned with those formats, Will Young has a list A strike rate of 86, a T20 strike rate of 133. That is to say, Will Young's just a good fucking batsman. And I think when you put Will Young in an ODI series against Netherlands, to me, that smells like a recipe of Wait, wait, is Will Young, like, really good at all formats? Like, Will Young might come into the mix of a one-day team, T20 team. Like, is Will Young just one of the best batters in our Aotearoa? Because I think a lot of people haven't pigeonholed as a test batter. And I'm curious to see what Will Young does against a Dutch attack. Like, he's faced Logan Van Beek a lot. He's faced Michael Rippon a lot. Like, these dudes are familiar or not as good as other international bowling attacks as well. So I think there's an opportunity for Will Young to score runs. He'll be doing so along as Central District's homie, Latudu Taylor as well. Um, decent CD presence. Doug Bracewell, Blair Tickner, 
Dane Cleaver. Also, from uh, the variety show, Deep in My Mangroves, I, I, I said no Rajan Ravindra, no Cole McConchie, no Cameron Fletcher. There was one more. I've got it written down right here. Blundell, no Blundell. No Ajaz Patel either. And curious to see what happens. Ajaz Patel bowling to finish the season, not taking a whole lot of wickets after his uh, big game against India. But yes, Will Young is my second joker, third and final wildcard. Yeah, I I had a few options here. It's interesting as well that we've all gone with quite like established players here. Um, if Will Young wants a good example of um, how not to be pigeonholed as a test opener, which I do think happens to a lot of test openers, um, then he he looked no further than Tom Latham, who's a number five batsman, wicketkeeper batsman for the Black Caps and ODIs. Um, however, I didn't I didn't go with Latham. I thought about it, and then I thought, well, what is there to learn about Tom Latham? We know how good he is, and expect him to be excellent and continue his leadership. Um, things I wondered about Michael Bracewell as a debutant in the um, in the group. Um, wondered about Colin de Gronholm just because he's Colin de Gronholm, but again, like what else is there to learn? There's nothing. You just to sit back and enjoy the roller coaster. Um, so I went with Ish Sodi, and it's very similar reasons to why I went with um, Matt Henry is because Ish Sodi does play a bit of ODI cricket. He's first 11 in 2020s, hasn't played a test since 2016, so there's like a descending little um, arc there. Uh, but he does, you know, he's in and out of the ODI stuff. Whenever they want to pick a second spinner, he's he's the guy who gets called up. Um, but it's always playing alongside Mitchell Santner, who he has such a comp like such a good combination with in 2020s. Here's an opportunity for him to play without Mitchell Santner in an ODI series. Um, and I hope he gets to play all three of these games as well, because they are in like I, you know, there's there's two games at Bay Oval and one in, in Seddon Park. I'm not sure, but um, it's definitely at least one in. in um, and Tauranga or Taronga as they keep calling us <laughs> the overseas uh, commentators at the Women World Cup um, that you know there's a good spinny wicket so there's, there's an opportunity for him to play there I hope they don't just be like well you know Michael Bracewell can do the whole thing and I did consider looking at the squad there maybe there was even a, a bit of room for someone like Ajaz Patel who I think has played um, a, like a spare 2020 or two um, don't think he's played an ODI, so he could have become an all-format player with this one. He um, won't get that opportunity, but uh, well, at least not yet. Um, Ish Sodi, though, I'm just looking forward to seeing him as like the frontline spinner, the main man again. Same, same like ideas as uh, as Matt Henry. Like the um, there isn't a Mitchell Santner there to slow the run rate down, so he can just be super aggressive. But there are like Colin de Gron Holmes and, and Matt Henry doesn't go for it much, and Jamison tends to be extremely economical himself. So no dramas there. He can just go out there and attack, and hopefully take a bunch of wickets. And um, I'm I'm enjoying the. Op I, I would like to see him um, do really well in that opportunity. It's like to to be a leader of the bowling attack, to be a strike bowler as the the number one spinner, um, as a leg spinner as well, which everyone loves to see. So uh, hoping for good things from him in this series. I'm hoping for good things from everyone. Of course. <laughs> I, I hope Mark Chapman has a good series. I hope Mark Chapman scores a lot of runs. I am curious and interested if he actually does though. Because we now have a decent sample size of Mark Chapman being a really fantastic domestic batsman who hasn't commanded like, holy fuck, that dude needs to be in the Black Caps every game status. And this is a, a, in front of the backdrop of Aotearoa having a lot of batters and a lot of depth, right? Like Mark Chapman is now well behind Devin Conway. He's now well behind Glenn Phillips as a all-rounder. He like he has been overtaken by various cricketers in the recent years, uh, going back to where a period where I think like 2018, 19, he was the hot batsman. He was the trendy batsman. Everyone loved a bit of Mark Chapman. I'll tell you what Mark Chapman has done for Aotearoa in ODI cricket. Four games, 10 runs, average of 2.5. Strike rate of 40. Very notable when you're also scoring 10 runs. Um, for Hong Kong, 
two innings, big knock of 151. Oh, 124 not out, sorry. Bauti at all, it's been a bit different for old Chapman. Um, he's struggled. Let's just, uh, let's say that. However, and, well, and this is juxtaposed against another fantastic domestic summer for Mark Chapman. Plunkett Shield, eight innings, averaging 45 with two half centuries. Ford Trophy, I think Auckland are the uh, Ford Trophy champions. Mark Chapman, 10 innings, average of 51.6, strike rate of 94, one century, three fifties. He wasn't quite George Worker with his four centuries and 150 and 10 innings. However, Mark Chapman did pass 50 four times in 10 innings. And I just think that tells the story of Mark Chapman. Like, if you ask anyone, they will say Mark Chapman, absolute beast. Like, whether they are specifically re uh, referencing his stats like I did there or just the eye test because you might go down and catch Auckland play a game and you'll be like, holy shit, Mark Chapman looks amazing. Also, Mark Chapman hasn't done much for uh, in his Black Caps opportunities. Just need to double check what he's done in T20 international cricket because I think he might have been a bit more active in the T20 format than his four games. Yes, uh, 14 games for Aotearoa in T20 international cricket. Average of 22, strike rate of 127. Which is quite on par with his uh, 19 games for Hong Kong. Average of 23, strike rate of 112. All of which presents a dis decent sample size of Mark Chapman being all right at international cricket, but not Mark Chapman commanding consistent selection for every series. And now we have the factor where he's, you know, Glenn Phillips is bowling more than him. And it'll be interesting in the series wildcard. You mentioned Ish Sodi bowling his leggies, front line, main dog, spinner. Why was Mark, my Michael Bracewell called into the squad? Batsman who bowls spin. Mark Chapman does that role. And like I can't really bring Rachin Ravindra or Cole McConchie into this equation because they're not in the squad. So I'm interested in who bowls more, Michael Bracewell or Mark Chapman. In the same way I was interested in who bowls more, Glenn Phillips or Mark Chapman for Auckland this summer. Now we're going to see Michael Bracewell versus Mark Chapman under Gary Steard uh, in a squad selected by Gavin Larson, both of whom have previously wanted Mark Chapman to develop his spin bowling. So if we come, to, if we have the series and Michael Bracewell is bowling five overs, six overs, most, most of the game, so he's bowling his 10 overs and Chapman might bowl an over or he doesn't bowl, I think that's going to tell us a lot about the standing of Mark Chapman in this wider Black Caps depth chart as well. I will stop short of saying it tells us a lot about Gavin Larson's talent identification, but it will tell us something about the uh, Black Caps, Mark Chapman's standing in the depth chart. Question on that one is, do you think he plays all three games? Because if you look at the, like, we know that, Guptill and Nichols have been the opening partnership um, recently. We know that Latham likes to bat five. and um, Well, I mean, there's a way in which you can fit Will Young, Michael Bracewell, and Mark Chapman all in the same team and have one of them probably, probably Bracewell batting six. Um, there's also potentially a more likely scenario where Colin de Gronholm bats six. You only pick two out of those three, and then you've got like Jamison, Sodi, um, Henry, uh, Chuck in one of uh, you know Bracewell or Tickner or whoever to, to fill it out. Um, like, I it's like, I wonder if there's only two spots available for um for those three batters, um, two of whom are in your um in your in your most interesting, and then one I toyed with considerably for mine as well between Michael Bracewell, Mark Chapman, Will Young. I wonder how that goes, guys. I say you can pick all three. Like there is a and there's, feasible way to pick all three especially because michael bracewell is going to give you some overs mark chapman maybe give you some overs probably not uh, based on recent form but 
uh, there's also a feasible way in which one of them has to miss out and it could be a rotation everyone gets two games it could be like one guy sits on the bench the whole time i don't know but i i wonder if you had to drop one of those three like one of those guys had to had to fall out of the 11 i almost wonder if it would be chapman um despite being i think the most experienced uh, none of them have played a lot of odi cricket but um you know brace well hasn't played at all young i think only has that one bangladesh series um chapman's played what'd you say four games <laughs> four games is the most they're all just like effectively they're all trying to play and like holding on to a position in a squad that would otherwise normally have like um that in fact i wasn't even thinking of taylor there was i so definitely you can't pick all three of them um i already moved my first most interesting guy i forgot to put him in there at four so well, i mean i interesting how that goes but that probably means you definitely got to drop one of those um three other batsmen don't you so i i wonder how that goes and i wonder if chapman might find himself as the unlucky fella there especially because the things that he offers um which you pretty much just said but the things that he offers left hand batsman um can hit the ball a long way so he can bat like but also with a classy technique so he can bat like early on in innings late in innings um no dramas there gives you a bit of spinning as well well michael bracewell does literally all of those things and is in um every bit as good a form if not better if you include like the bowling um, numbers as well so yeah i i, I don't know how you reckon that balance is going to go but I, two into three, I mean, three into two doesn't really fit, does it? And the top five without Mark Chapman doesn't sound bad. You got Nichols, no. Guptill, Young, Taylor, and Latham. One, two, three, four. Four of them are test players. One of them is among Aotearoa's best white ball batters ever in Guptill. Yeah. So it sounds pretty good without Chapman. Like, Chapman could slide into that middle order mix where you do have the DeGrand Holmes and Bracewells in contention. Um, I wouldn't be, also, I wouldn't be adverse to, like, Tommy Latham taking on a different role with the bat. Like, he might open. He might step up to number three and then putting Will Young in a different spot. Or he just, like, Tom Latham owns that number five spot in ODI cricket, which I think we have both in both forgotten about at various points. And I think a lot of other people forget Tom Latham, bats number five, wicketkeeper, ODI cricket, fantastic cricketer. Um, and like you, because I actually, I forgot Taylor when I was writing it down. I said Nichols, Guptill, Young, Latham, CDG, batting five. And that also sounds fantastic without Chapman. And then you just add Taylor at number four and then Latham goes five, CDG goes six, right? Like, personally, I don't see any any reason why Chapman should be selected ahead of those dudes. I can there there's an understandable case where you can say Chapman should be selected ahead of Will Young or something like that. Like fair play. Um, also, we have to be aware that this is a ODI series. Well, let me say that again: a sporadic ODI series against Netherlands to finish the summer. There may be a couple of. Uh, you know, tweaks to the lineup. And I don't think you're going to see a first 11 rolled out for all three games. You're going to see a lot of different dudes get an opportunity. So I'm sure Mark Chapman will play. Um, and I'm also dubious of saying this was the best team. That was the best team, like first 11 selection wise, because it's just different combinations of players. But on top of the bowling curiosity, as you've outlined and as we've just discussed, there is a reality in which Mark Chapman's a non-factor in the series. And that makes for interesting meditations moving forward, especially around the white ball team. Any final thoughts there, Wildcard, before we move on to football? Well, I guess just that it's going to be lovely to actually have an ODI series when you think about like um, how so many of the great Black Hats moments have come in ODI cricket and we've got this Women's World Cup that's been just absolutely outstanding and like a, you know, an incredible um, reflection of what a, what a one-day international can be with some of the, you know, the entertaining contests and the, the close finishes and everything like that. Um, I, I mean... We're not necessarily expecting that. I think Netherlands are probably better than some people will 
assume, um, but you still would expect the Black Caps, even with a second eleven, to 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 win all these games. Not to necessarily thrash them in in every game, um, but to you know they they should be winning. Um, it's kind of similar areas to some of the stuff I've been saying about the All Whites actually in this group stage of the Oceania stuff. It's like don't expect them to necessarily thrash um, teams when they're like you know, working through different combinations and guys who haven't played together before and um, missing key players, but expect them to go out there and win just however it happens sort of thing. And yeah, it's just great to see some ODI cricket when we've played, what, one series, I think, since the since since making the final of the 2019 World Cup. I think we played three games against, um, against Bangladesh since. They might have, I can't remember if the India series was after that or before. They might have played six games since that um, World Cup. I'm not sure, but not a lot. Like we're getting like one ODI series per summer. Um, it's it's not it's not great. This is the reason they are playing this is because there's like an ODI league championship type thing, similar to the Test Championship. So that it's like basically been encouraged that we got to play some of these games. And they would have played more if it weren't for pandemic stuff. So um, it's not entirely a deliberate decision, but we've been starved of ODI cricket and here's an opportunity to watch some and I'm looking forward to that. We, the All Whites are currently continuing along their oceanic qualifying journey. So we don't need the, I don't think we need the deep dive into All Whites footy because it, it is an ongoing situation, but apparently you can tie some All Whites discussion into Wellington Phoenix and I am building a bit of buzz here, Wildcard. I'm feeling it in my loins, just a bit of uh, A-League late season, stepping into, you know, knockout footy, if that exists in A-League. But I am feeling a, a, a tinge in my loins, especially now that we've got a bit more clarity around fans at games, Phoenix and Warriors and Breakers being able to play in front of people back in Aotearoa, connection to fans, all that good stuff. And I'm checking in. I'm just uh, tapping back into some Wellington Phoenix here, wildcard. Currently seventh. And they have the same number of wins as the fifth place team, which is encouraging. Of course, draws come into the equation. And this week they are playing Perth Glory who apparently suck. They are last in the A-League. And I'm curious here, Wildcard, how grounded in reality is my little bit of fizz for Wellington Phoenix football this right now on, the, on March 24th? And then I am curious, what is the connection to all whites stuff that you were you were thinking about well the connection with the all whites is that players have been going back and forth between them so like they because of the international window shenanigans um with the timing of this oceania qualifying tournament the all whites have basically like um kind of filtered through like a three-tier squad like a lot of the you know joe bell hasn't featured in the first two games libby kache hasn't um few other guys like that stefan marinovich so like guys like that um and you know chris wood got in in time because his game on the weekend was postponed because their opponents were going to be crystal palace who were in the fa cup uh quarterfinals i think instead um so like they just weren't they didn't have their best players available so they drew from a lot of a-league players in the first um game and then those guys were still there for the second game but filtering in a few more guys like uh, like chris wood like elijah just um, and then third game is going to be like everyone is available, but the A-League guys have all gone back with the exception of Tim Payne. So you've had like, you know, Ben Wayne from the Phoenix um, made his international debut and scored the winner in the first game. Um, ben Old came on at the same time, also international debut. Um, Ole Sale, international debut. Um, he's kept two clean sheets in two games, which is, you know, he's great. He's, he's, he's played really well with limited opportunities to make like the kind of dramatic saves you see for the phoenix but that's because the defense in front of him has controlled things but two games two clean sheets can't complain um he's had to wait a long time to get an opportunity as well for the for the all whites just as he had to wait a long time to get an opportunity to like play regularly for the phoenix um and he's someone who's made a habit of taking those opportunities when they come along so there you go um clayton lewis was the other one and he was 
you know, pretty good in the first game and I thought outstanding in the second game. Once you chucked Marco Stamenich next to him and um, and Lewis got to be, I think my write-up, the phrase I use is that one they talk about with like Jordan and Pippen, you know, um, Batman and Robin. Like he didn't have to be Batman like he was in the first game. He got to be Robin, so Stamenich is Batman and he was just outstanding in that role. Like freed him up a little bit more, didn't have to worry about covering extra space. Um it was like a flat two rather than him being deeper behind two others where he's obviously like it's the anchor kind of guy having to cover more room. Um, and then that just means he's getting on the ball in good areas and pinging his amazing passes like the, um, his, his set piece delivery recently. And this is a trend that's been um, been the case for the Phoenix first and foremost, but it was the same with the always. His set piece delivery has been so good lately. Um, it was his free kick that set up Chris Wood's first goal against Fiji as well. So Lewis is coming back in excellent form. Um, maybe a little bit tired from the travel in the games. But, you know, Wayne and Old and Sale are also coming back. And if you look at the Phoenix Fizz, like, it's, you know, it's the, some of the Fizz has worn off. A few of those bubbles have popped in the last week or two because they had a frustrating loss to Brisbane and then they got smoked by Newcastle. But they got smoked by Newcastle without those all whites guys that I mentioned. Um, the flip side is that now Tim Payne has gone over to join the Wellington Phoenix for the rest of, I mean, the all whites for the rest of their qualifying campaign um short on right backs as they are so he's not available for the phoenix for the next i think two games he misses um lewis and company only missed one game that newcastle game and we saw what that looked like when you take like four um you know well three probably three starters based on the recent couple games and then also ben old who's been a regular um a regular you know feature in his in his first proper a league season first full a league season so you take that, and plus is what David Ball was suspended that game. Alex Rufer is out for the rest of the season with injury. Um, a couple other injuries like Piscopo wasn't there. Um, you take like six players probably out of their first, out of any A League team's first eleven. They're probably going to lose four 0 to Newcastle Jets, exactly like the Phoenix did. You know, that's not. I think that's a write off game. Like that didn't really matter. Um, and in that light. I expect them to bounce back nicely against Perth. And I th hopefully carry on the way they had been going with that. I think it got up to seven game unbeaten streak, which sort of resurrected their season. Um, and I'm hoping that's the stuff we see from them the rest of the way. Clayton Lewis is an interesting one because he now doesn't have Alex Rufer. Those two had started every single game together up until the point where Rufer got injured and Lewis went to international duty. Um, probably see Nick Pennington just slot in alongside Lewis, but that does mean Lewis might have to be like flip that Batman and Robin thing again, where he might have to be the slightly more defensive guy, which isn't really playing to his full strengths. Um, but he can do that. Like, that's fine. He's he's good enough to play that role. It's just, I'd, I'd rather him being able to, but maybe you see a different dynamic with a different partner. Who knows? We'll see how that goes. Um, but there is a bit of pressure on him the rest of the way with Rufa no longer there to carry them the rest of the season. What does look like a season that, should on on the form they show the last couple months even disregarding the last two games like or even including the last two games rather i should say like that form is good enough to take them into the finals that form is like if they you know don't um you know avoid a avoid some of those suspensions and don't have their depth tested too much and injuries and whatever like that form is good enough for them to win a finals game, which hopefully will actually happen this time around. You know, um, that's the next step for this team, not just get to the finals, but like win a game, go on a little bit of a run. So they're good enough to do that. I think that fizz is very much warranted. Like that's what I'm hoping to see from this Phoenix team. Um, the roof for injury does make things a little bit frisky just because they're like one injury closer to like their depth being tested too far. And we saw that, like a nice lesson that Newcastle lost that no team is going to survive losing that many um, first team players all at once. So we'll, we'll see, but Perth, yeah, it sounds like Perth is probably a good matchup for them to be playing at this time. Um, uh, they've got cover for Tim Payne. Um, you'd rather have Tim Payne in there, but someone like Louis Fenton is good enough to do a job. He's um, that that's fine. Um, Laws slides back into center back alongside Wooden. That's fine. All goods. Uh, Lewis slips back into into midfield. Ben Wayne maybe goes onto the bench or starting up front. Who knows? You know he scored in his last Phoenix appearance. He scored on debut for the All Whites, so um, he's coming back around into some good touch there. I, I think, despite those last two results, I still think the Phoenix are in a very good place, and I reckon the emotional boost of of finding out they'll be able to get a couple home games before the end of the season as well. Um, 
that could be a nice trigger for them to like really like to you know deliver the goods on the weekend with a nice comprehensive bounce back result which is probably what they need about now and i think there's good reason to expect that it could happen zoom out a bit what's the like standing of the season are we halfway through are we three quarters of the way through how like just break down some of that stuff because i um it feels like we should be near the end of the season right <laughs> it feels like we should be at least two thirds through i think the phoenix are probably only about half just because there's been a lot of postponements along the way um but yeah i mean <laughs> it's a weird season always the a league is just a weirdly timed season um a, a lot of uh, just scheduling bafflement but um yeah, they're, they're, they've got a lot of games to fit into a rel like in terms of chronologically, we probably are closer to like two thirds, three quarters through the season, um, and it's going to be tricky for them because they are going to have to play a lot of midweek games over the rest of the season to fit all of the games that have been postponed, and um, and that could catch up with them. You know, that's going to be a lot of fatigue. That's going to be difficult to get through. Again, that's going to test your depth, and we know that it's like depth is not going to be an unlimited resource in in any team. Um, but the Phoenix as well, like um, they're pretty good at being able to get a couple guys to step up and cover. But if they're in a situation where they need like four or five guys all at once, I think every team is struggling in that scenario. So if they have to play this many games and I mean, I think, I think traveling back, like there's a game in Auckland, there's a game in Wellington is what they've, what they've said. Um, international travel might complicate that i think probably the buzz of of being able to play in front of a big home crowd probably over overrides that so i don't think that's going to be an issue but the yeah the constant like wednesday saturday kind of turnaround is is something they'll have to overcome the rest of the way like that is definitely going to be a hurdle there there might also be a bit of a flow to it like there could be yeah you just know there was a bit earlier when they went on the unbeaten streak there was definitely a bit of a flow to that and it started off with studded gains, but it ended up with like they were doing a lot of those quick turnarounds and they were getting like grinding out good results. So, because if, if the games are coming hard and fast, then you're winning. Yeah. It sounds pretty honky dory. If like if you're um, scratching together draws and losses, then you're trying to dive into your depth bag and ex you're expecting your depth players to generate something, which doesn't feel conducive to winning and that is evident in the Aotearoa Warriors <laughs> if you're given we go. if you're given depth players and young players lots of game time it's just simply not conducive to winning the good thing is the Warriors aren't a very good team so it doesn't really matter you know like you can play a lot of these young players and give them time Without this, this is all my perspective, World Cup. So I, I'm a fair play. The coach can't come out and say this. Like the Warriors can't come out and say this. But I am trying to be as mindful as I can with the Warriors. And I have to keep it real for casual fans who jump on the bandwagon or just hardy Warriors fans. Like the Warriors just aren't a top half NRL club right now, team. And I think that is kind of good because it gives a chance to some of these younger players to just stack up NRL games, which I think is actually the reason I'm big on this is like a lot of these players haven't played a lot of footy. Limited reserve grade. Um, and when they do have opportunities to play NRL, a lot of them are like in and out. Like I don't think Chanel Harris-Tavita has played 10 games in a row like off the top of my head in the nrl as a half right like that's not happening let alone someone like rocco berry who like might may be playing less than 20 games of rugby league right now like these are facts they're not facts because i've kind of made them up but they are <laughs> they are feelings that feel factual and also really important like if you're, if you're playing dudes in the NRL who have barely tasted reserve grade footy to any great extent, let alone stacking up regular NRL games, it just, like, good or bad, it's not conducive to winning. 
And I think the Wellington Phoenix have the type of depth to be able to ride that wave a bit better because um, their young players are players that are being called up to the All Whites. That only happens when you're playing regular games for the Wellington Phoenix to command attention, demand selection. And then you also have to demand selection with your play. So it's like the, it's a tiered system, right? Like you have to get regular game time in the highest possible league. In this case, it's NRL and A-League. And then you have to perform well enough to keep earning selection. And then from there, you perform well enough to catch the attention of higher honours. That is the caliber and that is the situation for the Wellington Phoenix's young players. The Warriors' young players, they're still trying to get like five games of NRL footy together. Like even uh, someone like Elias Katoa. Really good, two games, three games, then injury suspension. You know, like that, that stuff just eats away at a season, let alone all the bullshit the Warriors have to deal with as well. So that is to say that it's a, it's a beautiful matchup this week against the West Tigers because the Tigers are also not a very good team. And I'll, I'll get into the Tigers in a second because they are a really interesting Kiwi NRL team goes without saying Michael Maguire Kiwi's coach for the Warriors I I'm kind of balancing a bit of tension here because I want to say that we like my mindfulness approach is kind of like release the result and just follow the team that's how I'm covering it. that is the best way for me and my sanity and the best way to do my work if the Warriors lose this game, they're 0-3, and their three losses have come against the Dragons, Titans, and Tigers, who are teams that exist in the same pot of like bullshit as the Warriors. So if the Warriors start their season 0-3 against three mediocre teams, no offense, that is Taken. <laughs> that is weird. Like to me, that is ultimate. Warriors curse weirdness where they've lost all three games against other crappy teams. It's not like you know, Warriors poor start to the season, Storm, Roosters, and Sharks 2020 season uh, context. No, the Warriors have lost all their games against mediocre teams, and that's a weird spot to be in. Um, but also the Tigers are definitely beatable. And I think the Warriors forward pack is where we need to focus our attention for how the Warriors can beat the Tigers because it is quite a good forward pack. Big, powerful, really enjoying the uh, the efficiency of Fenora Blake. I think he's had a couple line breaks in the first two games already. Um, Josh Curran is getting a bit of New South Wales origin buzz, which is encouraging as well. And there is... There are signs of an identity there. Like if Josh Curran, I said in my Diary of a Warriors fan that he is the heart and soul of the Warriors. And if the heart and soul of the club, your team, is getting origin buzz from Brad Fittler, that's encouraging. And it's also, there is an identity there where like Josh Curran, if he's this heart and soul of the club team, it's like 100% ripping it bit of skill, bit of pizzazz, bit of mongrel, and a bit of fun. And I think if the Warriors are more like Josh Curran, the better, maybe is the best way to say that. Um, third halves combination of the season, like also not conducive to winning. So if that's happening, like we have to keep a, my expectations are zero for, like for starters. But if, you're, if you've got your third halves combination in three games, my advice to you is to lower your expectations because that is not conducive to winning games of rugby league. First sighting of Reese Walsh last week, he looks much bigger, um, equally as lively. That's encouraging. And yeah, like... I don't know what's going to happen against the Tigers. 
and I'm curious to see what happens because Tigers are uh, definitely beatable and 0-3 smells realistic for the Warriors as well. But they're not a million miles away from that being 3-0 and is the funny thing. Um, not quite like White Fern's level of, of close defeats, but like the, they were right in that context against the Dragons until about like a 20 minute spell um, midway through the second half. Like if you take that out of the thing and they just don't compound a few errors, then who knows what could happen there. They were winning. Like they took the lead early in the early in that half. Um, and obviously against the Titans, that was just a <laughs> toss a coin. Um, like just too many errors, but also it's not like the Titans weren't making dumb errors either. It was just a, like a, just a weird game of um, two teams who don't entirely know how to win games. Um and one team was just better at losing than the other team in the end. So that's why they're 0 and 2. There might be very similar areas um, against the Tigers. But, like, I mean, there's a huge difference between 1 and 2 and 0 and 3 at this stage, especially considering the teams that they've played. Um, we'll mention that the Dragons pushed the Panthers a long way last week, though. Um, if it weren't for a couple dodgy yellow cards, you know, something else might have been different. I don't know. It's the, they outscored them in the time they had 13 on the park. So a little bit of credit for the Dragons there, you know. So for any other teams except for the Warriors and White Ferns, when you're getting into like, because there, as you said, there's a fine line between good performance and result. And it's very easy to only look at results and not, actually absorb the performance and um, encouraging signs or areas of weakness that get overlooked with the result. There's something deeper though with the Warriors and White Fins, right? Like there is a deeply ingrained lack of winning. So for the Warriors, I'm thinking, yeah, there's some good stuff happening. Is it any different to anything that's happened before? No. And that's why I have to be 100% steak and cheese, full banger steak and cheese here, and say there's nothing different about the Warriors right now. And I think that's what a lot of people are looking for when they watch the Warriors early in the season. They're thinking new season, fresh vibes, what's new? That's what I was thinking of before the start of the season. Then you watch the Warriors and you realize there's nothing different. And good or bad, that's just what it is. So I, I'm encouraged. Yeah, like there are good signs from going close with some of these teams. But there's nothing new. There's nothing fresh. And also, if you're 0-3, shit's going to hit the fan. Like, I don't think a lot of people appreciate nathan brown the coach and i'm not here to, to defend nathan brown again i just try to be mindful and straight down the middle nathan brown there's nothing about nathan brown that is different to stephen kearney and stephen kearney stunk as warriors coach just as most of the warriors coaches have stunk before him so it's like it's hard like if you go, I can see a world and where shit gets real dramatic very fast for the Warriors. Um, a, no individual is doing anything different to previous individuals, so it's hard to really point the blame at them. And I would also suggest that everyone just chills the fuck out and take stock of the situation where maybe we just want to let the Warriors go through their own you know, situation without drumming up the drama because that might not be the easiest period for the Warriors trying to exist in two different countries. Like, let's just keep that in mind. And the Warriors are at least making efforts in two different countries in the same way Wellington Phoenix are in a very different way to the New Zealand Breakers. The Breakers aren't making that effort. The Wellington Phoenix and the Warriors are, which means that we have to be a bit more empathetic, a bit show a bit more sympathy to the club and this situation 
Um, but again, in saying that, three and o, three and o or zero and three, shit's going to hit the fan, or it's going to get pretty close to it. Um, which brings me to Michael Maguire, Wildcat, coach of the Kiwis, coach of the Tigers, and pretty sure the Tigers have both lost games, have lost both games already this season. So if the Warriors win and the Tigers go zero and three, shit's going to hit the fan for the Tigers. Um, Tim Sheens did come out and say, you know, stick with Michael Maguire for the season, which I believe is the correct move. And I want to make it clear because people might tie some of the Michael Maguire Tigers stuff into Kiwi stuff. Remember, this is a World Cup year. So the Kiwis are front of mind, not front of mind, they're lurking on the horizon. Michael Maguire's situation with the Tigers and the Kiwis are very different. Kiwis are, last time we saw them in 2019, riding high, winning games, um, good, good vibes in the team, which is I think which I believe is important from an eligibility perspective as well. You want to you want to make the Kiwis an attractive team for players with eligibility decisions to make michael Maguire has done that he's made the kiwis a really good team he's established a good culture within the kiwis he has made the kiwis a group where players want to be a part of so the tigers and kiwis are very different despite having the same coach and i believe like i think i've expressed this idea and it's it was definitely there early last season is they're here early this season a lot of these teams we kind of want to suck because the players below the nrl level are all kiwi nrl players so let's look at this tigers team james roberts isn't going to be playing nrl footy for much longer straight up like he will be out of the starting team by mid-season which is great because then Stafford Toa might get an opportunity. Junior Ponga might get an opportunity. I think the Tigers also have uh, Israel Ogden in their system. He's a outside back as well. Like if the Tigers forward pack doesn't step up, well, Tukimihia Simpkins hasn't played a game this season. He made his debut last year. So there is an element, apart from Kalmatua Langi, who was a smoky for Aotearoa Kiwi's selection uh, if his form can, continues this season. I think he's going to Manly next season with the Tigers bringing in Isaiah Papali'i, also a nod to the Kiwis uh, link there. Kamatoa Langi isn't playing this round. Very powerful edge forward. But a lot of the Tigers' depth is from Aotearoa. And I think Michael Maguire has gone with the older experienced players to start the season and try and get them out of this hole. But at some point, that's not going to work. And I can see that it's not going to work. And that's where the Kiwi NRL players are going to step up. And the Tigers, through Michael Maguire, have a lot of Kiwi NRL players in their system. But there's not a lot of Kiwi NRL players apart from Ken Mamalo. There's not a lot of Kiwi NRL players in the Tigers NRL top 17 for this week against the Warriors. So from a Kiwi NRL perspective, like it's a bit confusing because we don't want Michael Maguire to have the distraction of his, like the turmoil of the Tigers ahead of a World Cup. But then again, we might want that because then Michael Maguire is like, fuck all of you. I'm going to go win the World Cup with the Kiwis. Like, that might be motivation. We don't want the Tigers to suck because, like, I'd like Kim Amalo to have some happiness. Like, <laughs> it's been a weird old uh, couple of years for Kim Amalo. But maybe we can get the best of both worlds where the Tigers suck for a little bit, bring in some of their Kiwi NRL depth, and right the ship. Like, that seems like the best scenario for the West Tigers. Yeah, that, it does seem like the best scenario, um, which would be helped with a comprehensive Warriors victory on, on the weekend. Um, if that's possible, we'll find out. Um, 
I mean, I, I'm struck by something that you said earlier about like uh, leave the results at the door kind of thing with the Warriors because it reminded me of the mantra I, I kept using for the Wellington Phoenix uh, women's team, particularly in the first half of their season where it was like, just don't, you, don't even worry about these things. Like the, the results literally are not the most important thing. This is a weird season. This is a uniquely development season for that team just because of the scenario of how they got it up and running. Uh, late start, bunch of pretty much a squad entirely full of rookies, except for their um, except for their goalkeeper who had played one season at that level before, and a couple of Australian imports who were either coming back from injuries or weren't wanted by other teams. Um, like it was all about development until they developed so fast that it got to the point where like the development can't continue unless they actually start winning some games, and they did. They won a couple games. Um, overall, like a glowing success of a season despite the wooden spoon but that was an extremely unique scenario can't say the same thing about the warriors but there are some overlaps like i'm looking at their um look at the lineup for the weekend and like a one through five of walsh pompey uh arthur's berry montoya um montoya has been around a while like a fair few years um with the with the uh, bulldogs wasn't it but um the other four are all relatively I don't, I don't know what the career game tallies would look like for those guys but um it wouldn't be a lot and it's one thing to have one or two of those guys um among those positions it's it's another thing to have like you know four of them in in all key areas and um and like Harris Tavita, as you mentioned, someone who like Chanel Harris Tavita just hasn't played a lot of consistent, regular week in, week out games in the halves. He just hasn't had that opportunity yet. Um, it's uh, it, that that adds on to the same thing as well. Like there is there is a big level of of inexperience that this team is trying to overcome, and it, there's only one cure for inexperience, and that's to play more. Like this, to get experience is the only way to solve that. Um, there are also like I don't know what Ewan Aiken's doing as like a see there's one thing late in the season filling in as a back rower it's another thing when he's like your starting back rower to begin the season I'm confused about that one but although at the same time like I don't think there's really that many issues with that forward pack um Fenor Blake's been outstanding so far um Josh Curran is like he's he's one of those dudes who like you you look at and you don't think like natural incredible footballer but he is like the knack of just he's a playmaker right like he just he pops up in the right place at the right time to make the right play often in really important moments and when that happens over and over with the same dude it's no longer a coincidence eh? it's just like this is a dude who has a really great instinct for the game um and pretty good skill set too like I'm, I'm not saying he's a um he's some kind of scrub who just makes good decisions like no he's a he's a very good player and um i'm I'm glad to hear that he's getting some like wider uh origin buzz as well um and aaron penny off the bench as well has been massive and probably should get bigger me um, minutes than he than he has done um especially if matt lodge is like spewing on the sideline i don't i don't know if they did they ever clarify what the story was there was that just like a um because they didn't he was injured through a lot of preseason wasn't he so it sort of felt like someone who'd been rushed back too quickly and they just caught a bad luck day of um, extremely hot weather on a, on a afternoon kickoff, but uh, it's not the best sign <laughs> when you're spewing up on the first half of your first game of the season. Um, I don't know if they clarified if there was, some, I'm sure they probably just said the usual of like stomach bug or, or something. Um, that's normally what people say just to cover for those things. Um, but yeah, it's with with the Warriors. I, I don't think you can quite say the same thing as the as the uh, Welly Nick Wahine, because obviously they're not a first year team with a team like full of rookies. But they do have a they do have a large element of that, particularly um, amongst the backline, don't they? Like there there is a lot of inexperience there, and it's the kind of an experience that can cost you from like converting one or two extra chances uh, late in the game against the Gold Coast Titans which is the difference between a W and an L like that, that that's the kind of thing that can add up to that. Um, and if they are that kind of team with that white ferns knack for not winning close games, that's one of the major things that can tip those is just like, um, you know, little mistakes and experience, not quite having the, like um, the level heads in the big moment kind of thing. Um, 
don't think that's the white fans' issue necessarily, although there is a big difference between some of their least experienced and most experienced players. I think maybe there's is probably something stemming from a from a coaching um, perspective more than anything. But with the Warriors, there is there is definitely that. Like there is that context that needs to be kept in mind. It's not necessarily an excuse, but there is that context to this team, which is that they they have a very inexperienced uh, backline, and you cannot expect them therefore to just play like flawless footy um converting every chance and everything like that right what you were just explaining right there was winning whether you're young whether you're old if you win games you know how to win games if you don't win games you don't know how to win games and it just plays out it's a habit right um i will be clear i did not feel the need to follow up as to why matt lodge spewed up (laughs) wasn't top of my agenda so don't have information as to the specific reason of his sideline yak. I'm sure it was in good faith. Um, good the, faith yak. The thing people need to also like, I think uh, like we're just all caught up in how fast things move because last year, round one, the Warriors have Roger Toy, Vasashek, Dave Fusatua, Ken Mamalo, Peter Hiku, and Ewan Aiken in their back line. Only one of those dudes is at the Warriors this year, and he's playing edge forward. So the whole back five is different. Reese Walsh came to the Warriors mid, like after the season had started. Like, think this is only 12 months on. Like, I think it's literally this time last year when Reese Walsh like started to come to the Warriors. That process was happening. So we can't pretend. Like that didn't happen, even though everyone has, you know, jumped on the highway in a rocket ship and just blasted to where we are now. Like, yes, we're all aware of this, how fast time is moving, how quick, how like drastic change happens over the course of a year. But like, keep that in mind with the Warriors when you're bemoaning how shit a player is, well, that dude wasn't even in the equation this time last year. And I think there's a couple of those dudes with the Warriors. So it's just something to keep an eye on. Like, I think we all overlook the situation at the Warriors, not just with the pandemic and all that stuff, but how those things have changed the club like over the course of a season because you go back 2020 and five or six of like the top 17 or the top tier nrl squad went back to aotearoa last year tui vasashek lisa Namal, they leave midway during the season kim amalo leaves midway during the season like there is there isn't just change from year to year there is immense change during the season which again, not conducive to winning. However we want to feel about it, good or bad, it is not conducive to winning. And it's kind of admirable how everyone still wants to win with the Warriors. Like they they want to win, they want to push forward. And that's cool from an outside perspective looking in, their con their situation, their scenario simply isn't conducive to winning. If you're trying to win in the top level of your sport, you will struggle to do so going through what the Warriors have had to go through. Like if a uh, NBA favorite, those teams are the favorites in the NBA because everything is humming along nicely. They have players that are conducive to winning. Premier League favorites. They have systems in place. They've got consistency of roster. They have the best players in the world as well and various other things that are in alignment with winning. And then you've got to get on the field and actually do it as well. I think we all need to be realistic about different clubs and different teams and where they're at, where, okay, is their situation conducive to winning? Instead of just stressing because they don't win, actually dive into what is required to win and how do you get there 
And a lot of the things that are outside the warrior's control have created a situation where it's really fucking hard to win in a competition that last year wasn't as competitive, but is historically a very competitive league. Um, so, like, let me put it this way. The Warriors have always finished 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. And they did that when everything was lined up with winning. You got a home base. You got big signings. You got good players. You got good coaching staff, apparently. Like, everything is aligned, in theory, with winning. Right now, many people are expecting the Warriors to be better in a worse situation. Again, it's not conducive to winning. And it's quite interesting, I think. Now that I'm talking through it, it's quite interesting. It, it's super interesting because um, there's several things we've just pointed out along the course of this chat um, which fall into the not conducive to winning um, category. Like there's the... I think that player turnover point you just made is maybe the most important one of all because it's the most overlooked one. Um, they, they got rid of a lot of guys um, mid-season last year and they've been like rolling through, like cycling through players um, for a couple of years. And it felt like Stephen Kearney sort of, sort of like hit the reset button a little bit with a lot of that in his first year or two. Couldn't take them to the next level after laying that platform. And then Nathan Brown comes in and rather than like... Um, Rather than trying to be the guy to take them, like to use that platform to take them to the next level, he then um, throws some of his own choices and some stuff out of his control. Sort of just decides to like set another platform somewhere else. Like <laughs> it's it's ignore this uh, build site and we're going to move um, to the lot next to it and we're going to start from scratch, sort of thing. Like there's a lot of that um, players who were key players, like not just um, not, it's not just players that have gone It's key players have gone over the last like, yeah, 12 months in particular, but you can't stretch it out further. Like um, that's a massive point. There's also, you mentioned that the, the, um, the third half pairing in three games, that's another one. Some of that inexperience, some of like the playing away from home, that there's so many reasons that, that add up to this, like, yeah, maybe pump the brakes on the Warriors making the top eight this season and hope they set some foundations for next year. But then again, the like the NRL is a weird competition, and one good month can change everything. And suddenly, you might find those winning habits. Like you might you might learn them just by having a couple good wins, um, and everything could change like in a, in a vast hurry. That that does happen sometimes. Um, don't necessarily get to expect that though it's not really an expectation you can have it's more it's more a hope than an expectation full of hope no expectations yep it's not the worst place to be as a fan like it's maybe a healthier place to be than the alternative i mean if you're if you're a team like stable ownership stable coach best players in the world great style of sport, whatever sport you're playing, basketball, soccer, rugby, rugby union, rugby league, your, your local premier team, everything, you know, your second last year, same team, same coach, new facilities, everything's great. There's expectations. When everything is the opposite, like, like old uh, Bob Carter, those expectations vanish. And that is the niche cast. We will now vanish and then return. Hopefully. Definitely tomorrow for me because I've got work to do. Probably this afternoon for the wild card because he's got work to do. Pick it up to yourself. Enjoy Aotearoa. Enjoy the sport. And just uh, celebrate your existence here on planet Earth because wind it back full circle to the mindfulness wild card. Um, <laughs> I need to look up the quote again to get it right. Uh, the man of yesterday, uh, yeah, where are we? The man of yesterday has died in the man of today. The man of today dies in the man of tomorrow. Celebrate today. Celebrate yourself today because tomorrow, whole new geezer coming in. Might, <laughs> hopefully we're not all geezers coming from Greymouth, but big it up to Greymouth anyway. Cha-cha.